Um, so th thank you for joining us on this exclusive customer only webinar uh, for those of you that are registered with Sony's Prime Support. And actually, I'm Alistair Chapman, and one thing I will say, Prime Support's a great service. I've had to use it the once, and it was fantastic. They really did a great job. Anyway, so I'm Alistair Chapman. I'm a freelance uh, cinematographer, cameraman, been working in broadcast television for far too long now. Um, and with me today is Pablo Garcia. And Pablo, please introduce yourself. Oh, hello, everyone, to start with. And um, yeah, I'm Pablo Garcia. I'm uh, the in-house colorist from Sony based at uh, Pirate Studios. Uh, please feel free to check out the DMPCE uh, webpage for workshops, etc., and you'll find us there. We've had quite a few questions uh, submitted already, um, so we'll try to answer every single question. I hope we will answer all of them, either in the presentation content itself or as part of the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So we will try and make sure everyone's questions are answered. And it's really great to have Pablo on board because what we're going to talk about today is what is S-Log. And of course, a really important thing about S-Log is post-production. It is it's indeed. It's no longer just about shooting it right. You need to post-produce it right. So S-Log is a special type of gamma curve designed to capture a much greater extended dynamic range than is normally possible. But that then forces us really into a two-part workflow, shooting mm. and grading. You can't have one without the other. You've got to have both parts of that workflow. Now, we're going to look a little bit at history. So standard television gamma. So I'm sure most of you have heard the term Rec. 709. And something to understand about Rec. 709 is it's actually a standard for displays, not yes. really a camera standard. It's about your display technology. Um, and Rec. 709 it defines what you can see on your TV. And your TV will have a limited range of about six stops. Meanwhile, film has a range that exceeds typically 12 stops. Now, TV gamma is designed around some really very old TV technology now. I mean, this goes back to the very beginnings of I, television. It's about 25 years yeah, old, um, actually. It's been around a very long time. And to make TV gamma work, something that we use a lot of, because even a very basic camera now can capture a much bigger range than just the six stops that your TV can show, is highlight compression. Um, now, just, just sort of... Uh, the other thing is because of this highlight compression, TV gamma doesn't tend to lend itself very well to post-production, and it's certainly not suitable for film post-production. You wouldn't want to use 709 for a feature film or a movie. Yeah. So when uh, film was moving to digital, a way of transferring that film one-to-one -to, -one to a digital intermediate was developed, and 10 years ago when this was all, or 20 years ago in 20. fact, when this was um, coming into to play, the computers of the time couldn't handle this one-to-one -one transfer without having some help. Um, so a new type of gamma curve was needed. Television gamma wasn't suitable. So Kodak actually came up with a system called Cineon. And Cineon uses log gamma. So Cineon, the film scanning system developed by Kodak, uh, transferred film using a 4K scanner to uh, or 2K to a digital intermediate using 10-bit log. Now, just looking at that picture there, you have that enormous great big box. Okay, half of that's a film scanner, but the other half of it's a computer and a storage system. Basically, what's in half of that box now, you have inside your little tiny camera that you can put in your pocket. And the yeah. way technology has really moved on is quite amazing. Or your laptop. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everything that's in that cabinet you have in your camera and your laptop. So log gamma was used to match the way film responds to light. Now, the important thing to note about log gamma is it's not lossless, it is lossy, but generally speaking, the audience won't notice any difference. Now, it's not a form of compression, so it's, it's not, we're not talking about compression here, we're talking about a transfer characteristic that is lossy, but the viewer won't see those losses, so it's what's known as perceptually lossless, because the audience would never know. Um, but anyway, basically it allows a very big range to be recorded, with 10-bit data, because back then, 1992, when this lot started, 10-bit was, was state-of-the-art and yeah. took some processing power. And the first film to pass through this system was actually the restoration of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in 1993. Now, coming back to today, so most TVs and monitors that we have still can't show more than six stops. Your normal TV at home, based on 709, will be six stops. 
but your camera can capture a lot more than six stops. If you've got an FS7, F5, uh, even your A7S, there's 14 stops. A huge, huge increase. And you've got to remember, one stop is 100% more, so it's a lot, lot more. So we use tricks in conventional recording to take some of that extra highlight range beyond six stops and squeeze it into a very small space so it will fit in that recording codec. Now, unfortunately, you can't see some of the text on this slide, a little bit difficult. So we take a very, very big, on the, the, the block on the far left of the picture is what the camera is seeing, the block in the middle is what we're recording, and the block on the right is what we see on the screen. So we take this great big range that the camera can capture, we record it with a fixed size of codec, and we show it on our TV. And one of the things that you know, normally with 709 would mean that you'd miss off the really bright highlights or the very deep shadows to fit it within 709. Or the other option is to compress or squeeze down that highlight range into a much smaller space to fit within our same size recording codec. And a system that's very commonly used um, on most video cameras, it's the default on most cameras, is something called the knee. And the knee takes those bright highlights, squeezes them into a very, very small part of your recording range. Um, it doesn't really look natural because it lacks a lot of contrast. There's not much data in those highlights. But, you know, we're not going to grade this normally. 709 is normally about to shoot it, show it, no grading. So we normally get away with it. It's normally okay. But if you do want to grade it, if you do want to do any post-production work, there's so little data in the highlights that it's really difficult to do anything with them. So we have things like the knee. We also have things like hypergammas. These are advanced gamma curves that allow you to have a bigger range, a little bit more of a gentle roll off than a knee. But in both cases, we're reducing the data in our highlights. And just as an example, on the left here, we've got standard gamma with no knee, and then on the right, standard gamma with the knee. And you can see the left-hand picture, you can see how bright that sky is. Look how bright the sky is. Then we look at the right-hand picture where the knee is on, taken within moments of the shot, uh, of, of, of each other, and we can see the clouds, so the shot doesn't look overexposed, but the sky doesn't look bright anymore. Also look at the hood of the car on the left-hand shot, really bright. You can see this was a bright, sunny day, but on the left-hand image with that knee, it looks like a dull, overcast day. Now, the viewer, they're not going to think there's anything wrong with that right-hand picture because they didn't see the day, they didn't see the sky, so the viewer won't pick up on the fact that the picture is wrong. But what this illustrates is how that knee, that highlight compression, is actually throwing away all the contrast in the highlights, makes the highlights look very flat. They're not natural, really. They're quite compressed. And it's not really a great way of shooting. So what about log? Well, log is very different. So instead of compressing just the highlights, log, in, log recording takes our entire range and squeezes it all a little bit. And that allows us to record a greater range overall, but it does mean that each stop actually has a little bit less data. It's certainly in the mid-range than a standard gamma would. So we've actually, each stop is a little bit less data, but because we're doing that, we can put more data into those highlights. But nowadays, modern cameras have 10-bit recording. So having a little bit less data, but a 10-bit recording, it kind of makes up for it. So log with 10-bit, they play together really well, and it makes it all work really nicely. And this is actually where we get into problems, because some cameras now are trying to use 8-bit and log, and we'll come on to this a little bit later in the question section. And it's, it's much harder to make it work right. We can do it, but it's tougher. So anyway, what's happening with log? So here are our three boxes again. Left-hand one is what the camera is shooting. The middle one is what we're recording. The right one is what we're displaying. So now we're taking that full range off the sensor, all of it, squeezing it into our small recording range, and then showing it, I'll go back a slide, showing it on the monitor in a compressed way. So when you see it on your monitor, it actually doesn't look right because you've now got a mismatch between your, what you're recording and what you're seeing on the monitor and that makes the picture look flat. It's not really technically correct to say that log is flat. The, the reason it looks flat is because there's this mismatch between the camera's gamma and the monitor's gamma. But there's lots and lots of data in there, 
it's just in a slightly different place to where we would have previously seen it. So with log, it's important to understand that unlike a standard gamma, there isn't actually a highlight roll-off because all of the stops above middle gray are exposed with the same amount of picture information, the same amount of data. So everything above middle gray has the same amount of information. So even if you overexpose a little bit, there's still the same amount of information in your mid-range, in your faces, your skin tones, and all of that really important stuff. But as we see in this next slide, and this shows S log 2 and S log 3, there is less data in the shadows than the highlights. So what's this graph telling us? Let me explain to you what you're looking at here. So the scale along the bottom is f-stops, our exposure. Zero in the middle there is middle grey, and that's where Sony would recommend that you put a grey card if you were exposing a middle, uh, middle grey grey card. To the right is our stops above in terms of exposure. To the left is our stops below in terms of exposure below middle grey. And if you look at the lines above middle grey, you'll see that they're straight lines. They're straight lines because each stop has the same amount of data, the same amount of picture information or code values. Below middle grey, though, you can see those curves tail off into the shadows. And that's because there is a, there's a tendency for a natural roll off into shadows anyway because of the way light works. But there is less data in the shadows, good data in the mid range and good data in the highlights. Now, one more diagram just to show you quickly, just digressing a little bit. The gray line on this chart is Cineon. And if you look at S log 3, the red line, and compare it to Cineon, and also actually Aries log C, you'll see that the shape of the curves is almost exactly the same. And that's because they're all based on Cineon. And in fact, S log 3 is basically Cineon just adjusted by one stop in exposure. Anyway, coming back to uh, S log. Now, if you're used to working with conventional gammas, and if you've been a TV cameraman for many, many years, as I have, you'll know, or you, you're taught to protect your highlights. We're just taught all the time not to overexpose, because standard gammas with that knee, or with that highlight roll-off, they don't look good if you overexpose them. They just yeah. don't. Um, I mean, sure, I'm sure we've all seen it. Daytime television seems to be one of the worst culprits. They've got a studio shot, somebody comes in, and they've got a slightly bald head, and you get that highlight on their head, and it just looks wrong. Yeah. And their face might be okay, except that one highlight that looks like someone's got a laser beam on the top of their head, and that's that highlight compression. You've yeah. gone beyond 90%, 90% where that highlight exposure kicks in, and it's compressed like crazy. That's why our wafer monitors have been our, our best friends for this, just to see where your highlights are falling off, and uh, then just to protect your highlights in that sense. But that's not needed anymore. No, no, I mean, this is it. Standard gammas, overexposure is really, really bad, and we're all taught to protect our highlights when we shoot with standard gammas. But with log, think about the shape of that log curve you just saw. There's no roll-off in the highlights. Your only roll-off is in the shadows. It's the opposite of standard gamma. So with log, we want to do the opposite. With log, we want to protect our shadows. We really don't want to overexpose. So tell me, how easy is it to grade underexposed log? Oh, underexposed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's complicated. The thing is that for those standard gammas, uh, remember what we said before, we had six stops for standard gamma, for seven or nine gamma. You're recording 14. Any of those extra stops, the difference between those six to those 14, none of them are in the shadows. They're all in the highlights, have you seen on the graph before? Mm. So therefore, we need to learn how to expose it slightly brighter. Exposing brighter, it's not just gray noise or... We can deal with that. We'll, we'll talk about that later, mm. about how to clean noise and so on. But there's one major benefit, especially if we were talking about a bit of post-production, which is color. The human eye doesn't see color in the shadows. We actually go monochrome mode when mm -hmm. we go to low light. The cameras, they do exactly the same. So I can deal with noise. We can deal with noise. But don't ask me to bring back any saturation or any color information in those shadows, which is that filmic look. Yeah. Nicely saturated shadows and desaturated highlights. That will be kind of the trick for mm -hmm. you for free. I'm giving you a trick for free. Uh, that's how to make something look more cinematic. That's, that's it. So I can deal with noise, but don't ask me to bring back any color. So the key with log is to expose it nice and bright and to never 
underexposed log is, is the opposite, really, of yes. normal video. Is we want nice and bright exposure. So these are the exposure levels that Sony recommend that you use for log. Um, and I tend to use these actually as a minimum rather than a recommended level. This is what, what I would call your normal exposure, but really generally you want to be exposed a bit brighter than this if you really want to get the very best out of S-Log 1, or uh, sorry, S-Log 2 or S-Log 3. And, and largely when I shoot, and I think you, you, we were talking about this earlier, Pablo, mm. is the main thing is to get the mid-range right, because if the mid-range yes. is right, the highlights, they'll just fall into place anyway, and is to not worry about your highlights. And people really worry too much about highlights. Yes, and that's, that's, the thing is, uh, as you can see as well on this, on this graph, this, you were saying that this would be your minimum requirements. Actually, how all the manufacturers, they set up the nominal ISOs and things like that, is for a bright day exterior. They're giving you a midpoint where the mid grade will, and the only lighting situation you're gonna face with that, in, in equal amount of highlights and shadows-ish, is a bright day exterior. As soon as you decrease that brightness and you go for a more overcast day or for a low light, you need to expose brighter. Yeah. Which uh, makes absolute sense, I think, mm. from once you understand how it works. Yes. And yet, mid tones and low mid tones, you have now the same amount of highlights that you used to have from shadows to highlights. Exactly. So my, my, my experience is, is get the mid-range right, don't worry about the highlights, the highlights will just follow. And I've got some examples here of that. So this is shot actually with an FS5 with a Cine Gamma, Cine Gamma 3. And as you can clearly see, it's a tough shot. We, we're shooting into the sun, we've got this big area of overexposure, dark shadows. But what I want you to really draw your attention to in this particular shot is where, where the text says large area of overexposure, look at the tree branches in that area and look what those tree branches are doing. They don't look very nice. They kind of look strangled. They just really don't look very good. And that's because that, that roll off of the highlights doesn't have any detail, but we're, we're throwing away data in our highlights. Now, if we shoot the same thing with log, look at the difference in the tree branches. We've got a ton of data up in those highlights and we can now see those tree branches. Um, this is deliberately shot a little bright um, I grade it, not very well, I'm, I'm embarrassed by this grade, but I'm, I'm really, oh, come I'm, on. you let me off, won't you? Um, this was just done in Premiere, but again, look at what's going on in that highlight. I don't need to worry about that highlight. That overexposure looks natural. It kind of looks the way it did when I was there. If you shoot into the sun, that's what the sky looks like. Now, another example. So again, Cine Gamma 3. Um, the highlights in this shot, if you were shooting this, so when I was shooting this, you're looking at those highlights and it's like, oh, that's borderline overexposed. I don't want to go any brighter than this and everything else. You, you would not expose brighter. But now let's have a look at log. And again, those highlights actually look very similar. This is the ungraded S-Log 2. And the highlight looks really quite similar. There is more information in the shadows as well. We can see more detail on that branch. But watch what happens to those highlights when we grade it now, especially the, 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 the apex of the door frame. When you look at the log, it doesn't look like there's any picture information there. But when you grade it, I'm just going on one more slide to here, look at that highlight and also look at the highlights further up. You can see the bricks and the mortar. The textures are all there because that log doesn't have a roll off. It's there. You just don't need to worry about what's going on in those highlights. You have to have faith and, and just shoot and not fret about your highlights. It is a matter of detail. Detail in the highlights, detail in the shadows. Mm. Where do you need that detail to be? Yeah. Now, um, the other thing also is consistency, because yeah. you don't want your exposure to be all over the place. It's got to be consistent from shot to shot. Yeah, and, and this is going to be quite handy, especially for those that are coming from a more DSLR world or those who are using a histogram. That, yeah, exposed to the left, or not expo exposed to the right, right. sorry. Uh, that wouldn't work on a film uh, mm. workflow, let's say, because your consistency is going to be all over the place mid-range and skin tones are going to be all over the place. Your highlights are going to be perfectly um, exposed, but the rest of it is going to be so all over the place. Down, yeah. Exactly. So what is consistency is on your mid-range, your skin tones, your car, your pencil, whatever you're pointing the camera at, whatever is your hero on, that, um, on this particular story that you want to tell. That's what you need to keep the consistency in. So how do we do that? So here's some ideas. So some of the cameras, so A7S, um, A7R, these cameras, they don't have a waveform monitor, which is a really great tool for exposure, and they don't have the Cine EI mode, which we'll come on to in just a moment. 
So with those cameras, I find that if you use zebras and a, a white card or a white piece of paper, and you put the exposure so there's just the tiniest amount of zebras appearing on a white card or a white piece of paper, that's going to put you at plus 1.5 stops, which is just the sweet spot for those cameras, those 8-bit cameras. They, they, they might like to be exposed nice and bright. Similarly, on the FS5, for example, you have histogram, and you can use histogram plus a zebra point. And again, set the zebras to 70%, use a white card, and set that white card on that zebra point, um, and that will give you that same plus 1.5 stops. If you have FS5, A7, again with auto exposure, switch on the auto exposure and set the plus EV exposure offset to plus one to plus two, and that again will give you plus one to plus two stops. I wouldn't recommend shooting with auto exposure, but then you can use the one push auto just to set the exposure for that shot. The other method, of course, is Cine EI. If you have F5, FS7, these cameras, they have a Cine EI mode. And in those modes, you turn on the LUTs and set the EI, that's the exposure index, to 1,000 or 800 EI. And that, again, is going to put you one to one and a bit stops over. Um, and again, with the 709-800 LUT, if you use that LUT, it's a very narrow range LUT. So if you are over or underexposed, it tends to not look good very, very quickly. And even just judging the picture by eye, your exposure is going to be pretty accurate. If you're using the 709-800 LUT, and you want to use zebras, well then you just use them as you would normally. You'd have your zebras at 70% for skin tones and expose as you would traditionally. And again, though, don't worry about your highlights. Get the mid-range right, get the mid-range consistent, and the highlights will fall into place. And um, post-production, well, there's lots of ways of working in post. And we've got some questions about that, so we'll cover all of this in, in, in a minute. But one method is to use a lookup table. Of course, apply a lookup table at the end of your grading uh, workflow. Or an S-curve, and an S-curve works really well. Can, an S-curve, you can use the lunar curve tool, and you just pull yeah. the shadows down and take the highlights up. Perhaps, Pablo, you could elaborate. And actually, I would, before going for 3D LUTs, et cetera, which is a really common topic, and uh, we've got a lot of questions about 3D LUTs, uh, please try to use an S-curve. You might find out that you don't need 3D LUTs anymore. All that desaturated and dull image that you've got, just by applying a simple S curve on the luminance channel, you'll see how much saturation comes with it, how much detail you can play. And uh, and you can customize the way you want it to look like. If you want more roll-off, less roll-off on the highlights, if you want to the shadows to be slightly lifted, if you want more contrast, less contrast, that's all in a simple S-curve. What is an S-curve? It's basically a print density. Yeah, I mean, to, to apply an S-curve in Premiere or in Resolve, you use the Luma Curve tool, which when you first open it, it's just this straight diagonal line goes from the bottom left to the top right. And you just take a point right down towards the bottom left and pull it down, and you take a point towards the top right and pull it up, and that's your S-curve. And you can, yep. the, the, the exact shape isn't critical to start off with. You can fine tune it much la later on. And actually, most of the 3 d that you're going to be downloading, etc., what they got as a base is, a, is an S-curve. Is a, is an S -curve. Yeah. So that's the starting point. If you want to, if you know how to cook it yourself, do it yourself. Yeah, it, it's really simple and it's a great, and, it, and then you don't have to necessarily have the right LUT or anything like that, it, and it works, it works very well. Yeah, in Catalyst or even in Rovio or any of these apps, you can play with the, with the S-curve. And actually, as uh, Alistair was saying before, play, it, play with it yes. and get the experience of shooting lock and play with the S-curve before playing with LUTs or anything like that, honestly. Yes, indeed. So, uh, moving on. So, for the future, um, S-Log, uh, there's new technology coming uh, to television sets in the very near future. So you've got Rec 2020, which is the future television standard. And also something's being talked about a lot now is HDR. Now, if you haven't seen HDR, um, don't assume you know what it is, because it, it definitely is not that horrible photo method where you take two pictures at two different exposures and combine them together and get this funky looking, sort of not real is it, sort of contrast yeah. range image. HDR is about being able to actually view on your screen the kinds of dynamic, dynamic ranges that cameras can now capture. So we're talking about having incredibly true-to-life pictures on the screen with real contrast. So a sunset would be a great example mm -hmm. where the sun is actually bright. And real colors. Yes. Is a and big change. So if you get a chance to go and see an HDR presentation, please, please, please take it because it is an eye-opener and it's something that's going to make 
big, big impact, maybe a bigger impact than 4K. For those based in the UK will be in the BSC show in, um, in I think, by the end of the month. Yeah. We're so doing some, end, end some February, presentations yeah. there. Yeah. Um, or, or Pinewood, at one of the open or days Pinewood. at um, the Sony Center at Pinewood. So do try and see it. But basically, if you're shooting with S-Log now, your footage is high dynamic range. So it's going to be much more future compatible with HDR and things like that than if you shot with a standard gamma. So your library of S-Log material, and maybe you've been shooting for some years on S-Log, is already going to have some forwards compatibility mm. with HDR. So that really is worth considering. You can even say it in a different way. Log is an HDR capture. Indeed, indeed, yes. So anyway, so that's sort of the, the presentation side of things done. So we've got lots of questions here that we're going to try and get through all of them. So um, and I think this one, I think we'll let Pablo answer. So the question is, when shooting S-Log3 in custom mode, can the F5 LUT to convert to S-Log Cine be used, or is there some specific one uh, for the FS7. So I think we're talking here a bit about custom mode and Cine EI mode, the two different modes and LUTs yes. and, and things like that. And there's a part B to this question with, does this then make the footage the same as if shot in the Cine mode to begin with, or are there others? Okay, the key point, uh, the, the answer is yes. You can use the same LUTs uh, for one and the other because they are basically the same sensor. Yeah. So they are profiled for that sensor. But if you are in custom mode, there's things like noise reduction, there's things like uh, custom white balance that can deprofile, if that's correct to say it in English, yeah. sorry, uh, those 3D LUTs. So as far as you keep the same settings in one camera and in the other, they will work. Yes. Therefore, just use both of them in CNAI and you are fine. I, th I think something to, to, to raise there is that if you're in custom mode, the camera by default adds noise reduction. Yeah. And noise reduction can lead to banding in your footage yes, when indeed. you grade it heavily. So, so just, just do be aware of that and, and be a little bit careful. Okay, so moving on to the next question is, can you give us a LUT that we can download into FCP10 that gives us a starting point of what the camera would see without S-Log2? Um, I think the answer to there is yes. Um, perhaps not from Sony, though. So Sony do provide some LUTs. Oh, uh, uh, well, you, you've got the, um, the, the ones profiles. that, yeah, the look profiles you've got on the camera. They are, uh, I think in Premiere you've got them. Avid has them in, uh, embedded in the software. Yes. Resolve has them in, embedded in the software. And if not, you can download it from the Sony web page anytime. Yes, th those are the look profiles. But as well, you, um, if you go to my website, which is xdcam-user, xdcam-user.com, you can download the LUTs as well. I've created some of the LUTs. And uh, if you just search LUTs on the website, you'll find some free downloads there. Just, just help yourselves. And if you apply the LUT, if you're applying a 709 LUT, then basically what you're seeing is what the camera would have given you if you shot in 709. It's not identical, but it's really, really, really close. There's also a piece of software called LUT Calc, and if you just Google LUT Calc, L-U-T-C-A-L-C, -L there's a little piece of software you can download, and you can make your own LUTs based on the Sony presets, and that's yes. a really useful thing to, to have. And I've tried your LUTs, and they work. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, moving on. Um, coming from cameras as the EX3 and EX1, which are pretty straightforward cameras, how tricky can it be to use this technique or techniques like S-Log without risking ruining your shots, and what are the best precautions to prevent this? Well, S-Log, I mean, yeah, EX1, EX3, the only reason we think they're simple is because that's the way we've been used to shooting for a very long time, and then you just pick it up and you know what to expect. S-Log3 actually is no different. It is simple, but it's a different technique. So yeah. you need to learn that different technique and how it works. And once you've been, I mean, I've been shooting now with Log for a couple of years, and I don't, don't give it any second thought, I just do it. Yeah. And so the, the trick is to start shooting in log, practice, film some little short films, go out and film your cat or your dog or whatever else, grade it, edit it, work with it, get a feel for it. Don't go out on your first, you know, your first S-Log shoot shouldn't be a big paying job. You know, practice with it first and, and experiment. Yeah, I'd max go for hypergammas and that job and then yeah. <laughs> play in the weekends with log. Yeah. <laughs> but it won't take you long to learn it. No. And once, once you've got those few tricks just to get your exposure right, it's actually very easy to use and very simple and straightforward. Don't be afraid of log. I think that's the, the, the message there, really. Next question. Um, and and it was actually, it's a joining on question, I think, is how best to set 
set up SOD to best match footage between an FS7 and an A7S? Or A7S that would be or similar to the first question. Uh, it's as far as you try to set them up, the settings of the camera to match as much as possible, mm. you are making them as compatible as possible. But we need to understand that the S-Log implementation on the consumer cameras is not 100% as is done on the, on the professional ones. Yes, I mean, I have an A7S and an FS7, and I do know that they do look a little bit different. Yeah. I and mean, they come from completely different factories. I mean, they're, they're very, very different cameras, different image sensors, different image processing. There's lots and lots of differences. I mean, even if you had two cameras that were the same, except for their sensors, they'd look different. So. Yeah, it would be like, um, like you buy a Ferrari, but you're not going to buy a Formula One. You're gonna, you are expecting it to have technology that are coming from those yeah. super high-end cameras. That's what you got on your Alpha 7. I mean, the, the way you'll get them closest is to set them both up with the same log curve and the same color space. Although A7S, those cameras, um, we had a lot of discussion about this this morning, yeah. um, is that we're finding that the pro color matrix just works really well on the A7S yeah. cameras. This will be an off the record one, but yeah. I, I, I like it more than the S camera. So, on the so maybe if you're trying to match an A7S, um, Mark One or Mark Two, even and the FS7. I personally would be tempted to go with S Log Two and S Gamut on the FS7, and then on the A7S, I would probably use S Log Two again, but mix it with the Pro Color Matrix or Pro Color. And if you desaturate it a tiny bit, you nail it. Yeah, and and they do come out very very good. And then you can use an S Log Two LUT for both of them as a starting point, and that's an important thing, isn't it? LUTs are just a starting point for a yes. grade; they're not the, the final thing. Or we come back to that S curve, apply that same S curve, and they'll look really, really close. Correct. And even simplifying this, and, and sorry to come up with mm. this point, but the best way to match cameras are to get a nice color chart, place the cameras in front of it, try to emulate the settings in both and then try to see if you fine-tune something. But color charts and things like that, you need to experiment yes. with them. Color charts are actually very useful once you know how to use them. And I, I have the very nice um, DSC Labs color charts, yeah. but they are very expensive. If you can't afford a decent color chart, one thing, a, a tip I got many, many years ago from an old cameraman was to get a really good high-quality color photograph of a yep. scene. And you, know, and you want all the colors in there. So you want blue sky, you want green grass, you want faces, people, you want some reds in there as well. So something maybe like a fairground scene or a yep. circus. And get lots of prints of it done at the same time. So they're all of really nice, good quality. And then point the camera at that and play and use that as a reference. Um, color bars and Macbeth charts and things, yeah, they are very useful. But if one of those color patches is a little bit off, you won't notice it. But if you've got a picture of a real world scene and one of the colors is off, if somebody's face is a bit purple or the sky's a bit green, you're going to see it. Yep. So a good photograph of a, of a known scene. And of course, you can play with that at whatever the weather's doing. You haven't got to wait for a yep. sunny day or anything. You just point the camera at it and you can play with your log curves and your color and stuff like that. So really and I know that it sounds a bit complicated, but you only have to do it once. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and then once actually, you get it, go ahead. Yeah. Um, another question is how to reduce noise in shadow areas. And, uh, and, and, and as part of the same question, to have an alert to give a broadcast look for S log 3. So, how do we re reduce noise? What's the well, best the best way? way of reducing noise is getting the right exposure. Because there's one thing that every single sensor out there has, which is called signal to noise ratio. If there's no enough signal, there comes noise with it. So, there's no noisy sensor, there's no noisy cameras out there, there's wrong exposure, always. Then you can deal with noise after that, and um, I think we agree with both of us that NetVideo is a really good app, a really good software to reduce um, noise, but it's time dependent on it and a lot of power. Yes. You're gonna need from your computer. So some laptops don't even manage uh, yeah. NetVideo. And in terms of the um, broadcast look, as uh, Alistair said before, I will go to his uh, web page or just go for the presets or look profiles from Sony. Yeah, I mean, if you have a 709 LUT, I mean, 709 is what most cameras are sort of tuned towards traditional video cameras, sorry, are tuned towards is 709. So if you have a 709 LUT, it's going to be a, a pretty much a broadcast look. Yes. So, so any of the 709 LUTs will give you a, that, that sort of look. Um, yeah, so reducing noise. I think it's just actually something we were talking about earlier. Was you were talking about thin and fat negative because in yeah. film... I think one of the problems we have today is that cameras have become very, very sensitive. So there's a lot of 
uh, people want to shoot in very low light and are perhaps a bit disappointed by the fact that they're not getting the cleanest looking of pictures. Yeah, but I mean, uh, on, on a film set, uh, or if you're planning to get into a um, really low light environment uh, or shoot in a low light environment, the first thing you'll be surprised if you walk onto that set is the amount of light they've got. Yes. They tend to, I mean, it's way brighter than what you see on the screen. Because, and also the second thing will be to overexpose it in a bit. I mean, mm -hmm. every single DP that I've worked with out there will start with a minimum half a stop. Yes. And, and obviously in a really sensitive uh, negative. Yeah, I mean, if you look at most big budget movies that are shot in low light or that have very dark scenes, you never see noise or grain. No. And that's because it isn't actually as dark as it looks on the screen. The set is actually it's really, really bright. brightly lit. So basically what you do is what is called getting a fat or a thick negative, which is a really common technique. I mean, I don't know, for over 50 years we've been doing that. And then you, what is, you do what is called, you print down that extra stop or that extra two stops that you've been shooting. Yeah, I mean, it, with, with log, if you remember what that log curve looked like, in fact, if I back up on the, the presentation a little bit, I'll just bring that, um, that slide up quickly. Um, when, we, when we look at this slide, and you look at the shape of that curve, you can see how below middle gray, that line is flattening out. So that at that area, you have a very thin, what we'd call a thin log curve or a thin negative. Above middle gray, that line is much steeper, and that's where it's fat. So you want your exposure up above middle gray. That's where all the, the big information, that's where your the fat part of the curve is, whereas below, below middle gray, it's very thin. So if you're underexposed, you won't have much data. Whereas if you're overexposed, you'll have more data. Actually, now that we've got this um, graph with us, uh, what we're proposing, which is uh, exposed brighter or overexposed, mm. I mean, we'll be moving that line in the middle, that is the zero, will be moving into the one. Yes, And exactly. that will be our zero now. So yes. you are actually getting way more latitude on the shadows. So you are not sacrificing anything. You're just placing your mid gray yeah. on the curve, whatever you want it to be. Because it, you're not losing any latitude by in by exposing to slightly brighter. Basically, yes. you are moving your mid-gray. Indeed, indeed. And I think that is, again, comes back to what we were saying, is protect your shadows. Don't worry about the highlights, but just protect your shadows. So moving on with the questions. Um, I need to shoot an off-road film for National Geographic. They insist on frame-based 10-bit 42 HD, but the, which is fine for the FS7 or F5, but they're too big and heavy. The FS5, because of its size, would work much better, but this is 8-bit... Uh, uh, sorry, 10-bit Longot XADCL codec. Now, my answer to that is actually, with situations like that, when you, you have a very specific requirement where only one camera really works for the job, you have to go, I think you have to go back to the broadcaster and say, look, I've looked at all the options. It's not going to work with these big cameras. I need to use this small camera. The 10-bit 42 on the FS5, yes, okay, it is Longot. It's a Longot codec. It is an iframe but it's still 50 megabits, so it still meets the broadcast specifications mm. for HD. So I would be very surprised if they wouldn't let you allow, allow you to use that for an HD production. Uh, for 4K, it's only 8 bits, and it doesn't really meet the 4K broadcast standards. Um, but for HD, the FS5 should really be, a, be fine. I don't see Yeah, a most of them that. are still based on MPEG-2 workflows. Yeah, and running on from that, I mean, if you, if you were to try and then perhaps you know, convert your footage to ProRes. Well, the first thing to consider, if you encode or re-encode material, you're going to lose some quality. Re-encoding never adds quality. It's always going to degrade a tiny, tiny bit. It might be very small, but it's still a drop in quality. So going to ProRes isn't going to give you any better image quality, but could somebody tell if you've taken Longot and put it into ProRes? Well, with certain images, like rippling water or blowing leaves on a tree, you can see the difference. So for fast movements. You've got to be a little bit careful there. I, I, I would, you know, I'd talk to the broadcaster and, and try and persuade them to allow you to use the, the, um, the XAVCL. Um, next question. I'd be interested in S-Log2 and S-Log3 together with the S Gamut 3 settings implementation of the A7S Mark II, where it's not locked to a specific white balance as it is with the Sony FS5. What's the difference? And are there official LUTs for the A7S? Well, again, we've covered the LUTs. The LUTs were all made by Sony for the pro cameras. Yeah. But they do work with the consumer cameras as well, but they're not Yeah, but as so official LUTs for the Alpha, I'm afraid not. No, no. They, they do work. 
um, but they're not as, as finely tuned as they are for the other cameras. But coming back to the other one about the white balance settings and, and things like that, when you're shooting with FS7, F5 and these cameras, the white balance is actually locked so that you avoid ever having the risk of clipping in the color channels. Because if your red channel or your blue channel is slightly clipped because of a change in the gain, because white balance is a gain setting, you can't grade it. It's, it's your material's junk. Um, so you've got to be very, very careful using variable white balance with s -Log. You can do it, um, but just you really need to be careful. Yeah. Um, so it, with the FS5, you can, if you change the color matrix um, to the pro color matrix, you can actually mix log, S log 2 or S log 3 with pro color. Mm -hmm. And I've found S log 2 with pro color, especially for the 4K 8 bit 420 recordings, works very well, or it's certainly the best option, I believe, personally, for the FS5. So FS5, S log 2 with the pro color matrix yep. is really good results. So you can, by not using the S gamut, get away from that locked in white balance. But just be aware that if you are doing a big white balance shift, you could have some problems later on because of clipping in the color channels. Um, if you have 4K 8-bit 420, as in the FS5, exposure must be good. So is there any idea to using log? Yes, you can use log. It does give you better highlights, but you've really got to get your exposure right. Yeah. It's not ideal. It's not perfect. And do explore the other options, which is the cine gammas on the FS5. Yeah, and I wouldn't expect any the same results. I don't know, 55 or 5, no, for it, example. No, 8-bit is really, really pushing this technology to its limit. As you were saying before, the actually the s Log 2 is not working better, but I think it's more friendly with 8-bit yes. than s Log 3. Well, the thing, of course, the S-Log 2 is much more contrasty than S-Log yeah. 3. It's more pleasant and to look at as well. It would, it would need, for your side, it would need less pushing on the yeah. S-curve that we were talking about before. Yes. It would need less tweaking. And Actually, no, most of the time, S-Log, I even call it a three-wheel calibration log. Mm. So you don't go for any S curves. Right. And just three wheels adjusting highlights, adjusting mid-tones and yeah, shadows. Yeah, you, you can do that with S-Log 2, S-Log 3. That just doesn't happen. You've got to do you know, no. S-Log 2. S-Log 3 can. needs an S-curve. Yeah. So S-Log 2, because you're not pushing and pulling it so aggressively in post, tends to be a little bit more forgiving when you've got an 8-bit codec. Yeah. Great. OK. Um, so um, also about skin tones in post-production and how to preserve skin tones when using S-Log 2 or 3 and overexposing. Pablo. How to <laughs> just being consistent, as mm. we were saying before, with your with your middle gray. Yes. I mean, the skin tones, we need to think that the 18% gray is actually one stop below Caucasian skin tone. So actually exposing for Caucasian skin tones and going one stop over the 18% gray, you would be nearly kind of nailing it. Yeah, well, and again, coming back to, to um, this curve here, is once you're above middle gray, your skin tones or anything above middle has the same amount of data. So it really yeah. doesn't matter in terms of contrast in face and skin tones and the actual textures in that face, where you put that face, provided it's nicely above middle yeah. gray. Um, I think the problem some people fall into, though, sometimes is when they're grading it, if they use a standard LUT, and they don't. They just just try and use the LUT. The skin tones then are pushed up into the LUT's knee, or the LUT's roll off. Yeah, that would be another another point, and how and when to use the mm. uh, the the LUT. Because we need to think uh, a LUT is a it's a fixed um, filter. Think on a gel filter. Yeah. That you put it on top of your image. Mm. Um, if you are green on top of that filter, that's not your F5 or your F55 or any other thing. Like it, it would be. Um, an action yeah, cam, it would be, yeah, it would be a standard 709 camera. So you've lost all the benefits, first of all, of shooting log and second of a wide gamut. Mm. So you need to be really, really careful. The way of using them, for example, on Premiere or on After Effects, you can always add, um, add what is called an adjustment layer right. that will be independent from the clip. Yes. And uh, that will preserve all the benefits of log and all the benefits of a wide gamut capture. And uh, in Resolve, for example, would be using the LUTs always in the last node and any other corrections, that three-wheel correction that I was talking about before, mm. even the S curve we were yep. talking, underneath or yes. before yes. That, no that node. That's really, really important to, mm. to bear in mind and how to use the LUTs because obviously if we are promoting overexposure and uh, certain part of your skin tones are a bit clipped and you try to recover those highlights, 
after the lot, there's nothing you can do. But try it before that. Yes. And you'll be surprised the amount of detail that suddenly appears on those skin tones. Because yeah. then the LUT is applying that role of to whenever you are placing those highlights to be. Yeah, and, and this is a whole, it's a very, very key point of this whole S log workflow is if you are using a LUT, is the grading needs to be done on the S log, not on the LUT footage. If your LUT is 709, then your footage becomes 709. If you grade after the LUT, you're grading 709. Yeah. You need to grade under the LUT where it's still S log. I think the understanding of uh, what we need to understand is that this is a film workflow. Mm. And if we even think on film, because we are talking about ISOs and wide latitude and so on. Uh, once you apply the LUT, that's been printed. Yes. That's your print. If you correct over the print, mm. what's the point of shooting on negative? Yes. You need to do the corrections on the negative and then print it. And that will be the, the way of actually... Yeah, I mean, this is where the S-curve works quite well, actually. Exactly, and, and you were talking about before the, the senior standard. 3D LUTs, they were invented at the same time, mm. but to emulate print film. The S, the, or the senior standard, was for the negative, yes. not for the positive. Okay. Anyway, so, I mean, great, time. especially the, the use of the adjustment layer in Premiere, that's a really top tip, yeah. actually, because that puts the LUT on the adjustment layer and not on the clips. I think on Final Cut would be slightly different, but Final Cut always has an order of the effects that you are applying. Mm. And uh, if it's not with the LUTs or whatever, you stray with any other effects, and you'll see that the order of the effects, it actually changes a lot of the behavior of the clip. Yes, and, and, the same and, effect. and this actually comes on to the next question, actually, which is what's the best way of grading a whole program so all the, lot, all the shots match in look and the best way to match an, FS5, an F5 to an FS7? And again, it comes down to set the cameras up the same and yeah. be consistent with your exposure. Exactly. That's the only thing you need. Even though that, even mixing cameras with different sizes, uh, in this case, an F5 and an FS7 will be a dream because they are the easiest to match because they're the closest cameras to, to one each other. But a 5 or a 55, they got different ISOs. Don't mess around with the ISOs and expose them correctly both. So you're going to need different f-stops or yes. t-stops for each one of the cameras. And when you place everything into your timeline, everything is going to fall into place. And it's going to, as far as you're consistent, those is going to be super easy. Well, again, this brings us on to another question which actually just follows on. Um, when shooting in S-Log3 on the FS7, does changing the ISO make any difference to the resulting shots? I don't mean the viewfinder when using a lot, I mean in the S-log shots that are later on imported into the editing suite. I think to try and clarify this, I think what the, the, the question asker is, is talking about is, so on the FS7, F5, the cameras have the Cine EI mode. So we have two things there. We have the ISO, which is the camera's recording sensitivity. And in the Cine EI mode, that ISO is fixed. It never, ever changes. And then we have the other thing, which is the exposure index, the EI, and that is the brightness or the sensitivity of the LUT. And I like to really sort of consider those two as two different things. ISO is camera sensitivity, EI is LUT sensitivity. Completely different things. The, um, we need to think on cameras as a fixed stock of film mm. with its own colorimetry and with one single ISO. Yes. So, so what we what, what happens with that is when you change the EI, the only thing you're changing is the exposure index. So you're making the LUT brighter or darker. And if you were using a low EI, let's say a thousand EI on FS7 to give you that brighter exposure, what happens is the EI is lower, so the LUT is darker. Because you see a dark picture, you open the aperture, and as a result, your recording becomes brighter. But the actual ISO, the sensitivity of the camera, isn't changing. You are just recording something that is brighter, so that when you bring it into post, you're bringing your levels generally down. That improves your noise because you're brighter, you have better color, uh, and everything else that we've talked about. So yep. it, the ISO isn't changing. It is just how bright or how dark the LUT is. And then moving on. So when shooting S-Log3 and setting the native ISO, oh, sorry. Um, so the only control in this um, circumstance to maintain the exposure is the aperture and lighting. So how do I expose properly once it's done? Well, we've, we've covered this really already. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the answer is in the question, actually. It's just like by controlling your aperture and your lighting. Absolutely. You have to consider the camera as a fixed entity, a fixed stock, film stock. Um, and to, another question that um, came up somewhere, I've, I've seemed to have missed it out somewhere, is uh, using a light meter, of course, is also very relevant with, with these cameras because yeah. You know, there's lots of ways of setting your exposure, but if you wanted to use a light meter, of course you can. Put it this way, as, as you were saying before, um, LUTs 
I mean, waveform monitors and, uh, and, and histograms, they will be reading the values of the lot, not of the log. Yes. Which, and you were saying that the log is not going to change, but the lot is going to change. Mm. So therefore, you need to be really aware what you're looking at, especially yes. viewfinder-wise or monitor out, because we're thinking that we're recording log. Then, as soon as you understand how that works, and actually if you're slightly clipping those highlights on the lot only, that might not be clipping on the OS log 3. Absolutely. Therefore, the, having a light meter, yes. And then actually, is, they're not that expensive. There's really good apps for the iPhone and uh, mm -hmm. for Androids even, for 50 quid, something yeah. like that. And they work fantastically. I, I, per personally, I'm not a fan of light meters myself, but but that's just me. That's a personal thing. And oh, I, yeah. So I, I mean, you, you need to have the time to I'm, get there and put the light meter. Yeah. And set. I wouldn't dis would, would never discourage somebody from using a light meter. It's a very valuable tool in, in the exposure arsenal. And actually, this again brings us on to another question. You, you almost thought we scripted this, because the <laughs> next question is, with footage to be overexposed, is it preferable to use something like a, a, a Shogun or a Odyssey or an external monitor or recorder where you can add a LUT to the external device and preview um, and see how the shot would look with that LUT applied? Of course, yes. If yeah. you've got an external monitor and you can apply LUTs in your external monitor, it's again, it's another tool in your toolbox. Yeah, I think this question comes from definitely from an Alpha 7 user because obviously you can have load LUTs on the, yes. on the Alpha because mm. it's such a tiny body and uh, it's not meant to be doing that kind of things. But uh, an FS7 or an FS5, they got this, this, that, um, that capability. So you will be doing exactly the same. But again, you just as you mentioned earlier, be very careful to make sure you know what you're looking at. Correct. Yeah, you know, make sure you know what the camera is recording and what you're viewing on the monitor and, and you haven't got muddled up. I mean, I've seen people have a LUT in the camera and then a LUT in the monitor, so you've got a LUT on top of a LUT. Yeah. And that would be a disaster. So just do be very careful to make sure you know exactly uh, what you're doing. Um, main differences and benefits of using S-Log3 over S-Log2 when shooting with the A7S Mark II. A7S Mark II is an 8-bit camera, and again, I'd come back to what we said earlier about the FS5, is my preference there would be S-Log2 with the Pro Color Matrix. It's, it's just going to be easier to grade, it's going to give you better contrast, you're not pulling and pushing that log so aggressively. I mean, I've tried that, that setting that uh, you're proposing, and I can tell you that it works. It yeah. works beautifully, actually. But it's, it's as well a matter of taste, sometimes. Yes. Um, Another question, coming from a background in stills and stills advertising photography when shooting transparency film, I'd protect my mm. highlights at all costs. I found shooting on the FS7 in S-Log to be counterintuitive, and I find myself shooting to conserve my shadow areas and, and letting, I'm assuming, the, uh, the highlights overexpose. Yeah. This is, you know... It's, it's, it's the same as before. Uh, normally, with a stills camera, you are printing that lookup table or that density. Mm. So you are literally watching the positive, not the negative. While shooting in log, you got twice the amount of latitude to play with. So that therefore is not really um, critical to be so concerned about your highlights. So yeah. actually going and overexposing a tiny bit or one stop, two stops. I mean, I've done even tests of going four stops over and the amount of highlights that are still maintained on that is, is just ridiculous. So yeah, that's uh, is the same principle. Yeah, and, and I, I'd, again, I say yeah to, to TV cameramen as well that have been used to exposing and protecting their highlights for, for goodness knows how many years. It does take a bit of a leap of faith to actually just to sort of ignore the highlights, just focus on that mid range, get the mid range right because you do have so much latitude that if the mid range is right, the highlights will just fall into place. Yeah. And um, there's also the high and low key function on the cameras. If you are using LUTs, which you can assign to a uh, assign all button that allows you to peek into the highlights. When you're using a LUT, it's quite a useful tool. And that's a very good point because I think it's the best tool I've seen on a camera, especially if you're concerned about detail. Because remember mm -hmm. what we're talking about. We're talking about detail. The detail you can see in a, in a 7 or 9 LUT, obviously, it's going to be 6 stops. You're recording 14. If you want to really see how much detail you've got on those highlights, just press high key, and that will show you the two stops, the three stops in the top yes. and the three stops in the bottom. Yeah, it's a really useful feature. I always have it assigned to one of the buttons yeah. on my cameras. A um, couple more things, and, and we are going to have to wrap up. Um, one question is one of our um, 
uh, listeners, says he's filming in Australia at the moment. Lucky person, I bet the weather's better there than, yeah. than it is here. Um, won't be back until um, later in the year. Are there other courses coming up? Well, Pablo, you, you work uh, at the DMPC. Tell us about DMPCE. Yeah, please um, feel free to check on the Sony webpage uh, or just Google DMPCE Pinewood Studios. And uh, we're running like weekly at least, um, different courses, F65, F55 and F5, uh, FS7, and we might start doing now half days on uh, alphas and FS5s because they are pre they're big, they're becoming quite big cameras and there's a lot of fuss with them and there's a lot of questions about them. So please feel free to, um, to check the calendar and uh, we're running courses every week. And software for grading? The, uh, softwares are tools as cameras are. So it's a bit of, uh, depending on what tool are you more comfy with. So if you're coming from uh, Adobe uh, workflows, for example, maybe you find it more easy to go for a speed grade. There's no better software than another one. I mean, they're all good. Resolve is good. I mean, if I need to recommend some, I will go for a baseline, but you're talking about uh, <laughs> 150 yes. grand for, <laughs> but mm. um, Resolve can do it. Yes, and of course. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing I say, I mean, I like Resolve. It's, I mean, it's a price. Premier, right? Premier is fantastic to start and to finish, yes. to be honest with you as well. I mean, mm. it depends a bit on your talent. Uh, but I mean, one thing I say, I would say about Resolve is don't be afraid of Resolve. When you first no. open it up, it looks really scary because it's very different, but actually, it, it's quite easy to pick it up and, and quite easy to, to get to know. And I don't think there's other software with more tutorials on YouTube than Resolve. So um, we're coming to the end of our allocated time, so really sort of just need to, to wrap up. Uh, great having you here, Pablo. It's been absolutely fantastic. My I mean, pleasure. Yeah, you know, post-production is so important with Log. It's a two-part workflow, and you can't yes. lose sight of that. It's a two-part thing. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. I hope you learned something today. If you want to know more about S-Log, please visit the Sony Knowledge Portal. And there will be lots more sessions like this coming soon, so do um, keep, uh, keep an eye out for invites. The next one's going to be on understanding codecs, so lots of information on codecs and formats and things like that. Hopefully sort of um, uh, add some clarity to that. Uh, and I've been told you'll be there. I believe so, yes. <laughs> Um, and please take some time to answer the short survey at the end of this uh, session. It really helps uh, Sony improve these events for the future. And don't forget, if you want more details on Prime Support Plus, please see the details given at the end of the survey. So thank you very much for listening and hope to have you join us again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.